We're going to read a few verses, please, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Verses that we will know. And just a few verses down near the end of that chapter, beginning in verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Trusting God's blessing, as always, upon his own precious truth this evening. There are a number of things that people probably do not like to be called. You know, today we, we, we have a saying around today, don't we, that you can call me anything you like as long as you don't call me too early in the morning. Have you ever heard that saying? I'm quite sure, no doubt, you have. And sometimes, sometimes in, when it's someone in my position, sometimes someone will say to me, well, you know, what, what, what am I supposed to call you? Do I call you pastor or do I call you Denver? And I often say, it doesn't matter to me what you call me, because I get called many a thing anyhow, and probably we all. And it's good to be able to joke about, about things like that. But to go back for just a moment to what, what we're wanting to focus on this evening. There are some things that people, or there are some things that a person doesn't like to be called. You see, some people don't like to be called a nickname. And yet sometimes we're good at giving nicknames to people. Some people don't like to be called a, a shortened version of their name, and so on. And we all have different tastes, and we all have different thoughts and these kind of things. But whenever it comes to the Bible, there are some fascinating words that are used in the Bible to speak of people. For instance, there's the word righteous, which is used in the Word of God. The word righteous describes a person standing before God. And it means very simply, right standing. Right standing before God. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thine house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And there God was speaking of this man, speaking to this man, and God was highlighting this man standing before him. Noah was a man who stood right. What a privilege, what a, what a position to be spoken to by the Lord and to be called righteous by the Lord himself, standing right with God, standing right before God. Can I ask tonight, who wouldn't want to have that word attached to them? Who wouldn't want to be standing right before God? Another word that the Bible uses for people is the word sinner. And quite often you find there are many people who don't like that word. In fact, I've known people to get very, very angry whenever you referred to them as being sinners or whenever you called them by that name. And to be honest, friends, tonight, I never fully understood why. I don't understand why the word sinner annoys people. Because sinners are what we all are, every single one of us. Sinners by thought, 
Sinners by word, sinners by deed, sinners by birth, sinners by nature. Every single one of us born in sin. And to be honest, the word sinner, it certainly doesn't bother me because we can't even help being sinners. Because of the way we're born, because of the nature that's in us, we are sinners because of that. We're born that way. And there's nothing that we can do about it. So it doesn't, you know, that doesn't annoy me personally one bit in the slightest. But one word that I want to concentrate on for just a short time this evening, one word I feel that should annoy every single one of us that the Bible uses is the word fool. Who wants to be called a fool? I certainly don't like that word, and I'm sure you don't like it either. And the reason personally that I don't like that word is because the word fool is something that we can avoid. The word fool is something that we do not have to be. Who wants to be a fool? Who wants to be called a fool? And yet, friends, the Bible calls us fools over and over and over again. And so this evening, I want to simply look at this for a few moments And I want to look at some of the fools that the Word of God highlights. Some of the fools that the Word of God speaks about. The first one I want to direct your attention to tonight is found in Psalm chapter 14 and verse 1. And that verse simply says, The fool has said in his heart, No God. There is no God. And I call this person the atheistic fool. No God. You see, those of you who are older, some of you young people won't remember this, but those of you who are older will remember, remember back in the days of Margaret Thatcher, whenever she was the prime minister, and back in those days, they signed, now I'm not political, don't think that for one moment, I have no interest in that whatsoever, but back in, I just want to make that clear, but back in those days, do you remember, they signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement, do you remember that? You know, and after they signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement there at Hillsborough, we had all of these big posters and banners up all over the country. Ulster says no. Do you remember those? Ballymena says no. Portadown says no. Do you remember those posters? Maybe your memory's not as maybe you're not as old as I am. But anyhow, we had all of those posters. Friends, listen, that's what the atheist does. The atheist says no. No God, no judgment, no eternity, no heaven, no hell. Because if there is no God, then there's none of the other things that we have mentioned there as well in relation to eternity. The fool has said in his heart, no God. And you see, he wishes that there was no God. And so he ventures to think and to say that there is no God. I remember hearing this explained in an amazing way. I want you to picture that screen for just a moment tonight. Can you imagine that screen as holding all of the knowledge that it's possible to hold in the entire world around us? Now, you think of all of the all of the professors, you think of all of the the doctors in their profession, I'm not talking only about medical doctors, but people who have rules in their profession to the very highest, you think of the scientists, you think of the people who, 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 who create new technology today and to tell us that technology is outdated by the time it reaches the shelves of the shop. Now, if you can imagine for a moment all of that knowledge that's available in the Word, if it could be contained on that screen, And then I think about the knowledge I have. And the knowledge that I would have in comparison to that would probably be less than the size of my thumbnail in comparison to the size of that screen. The knowledge that you have would probably be the same. The knowledge that the atheist has would probably be the same. And yet the atheist is a person who says, no God. Do you know all he's saying? He's saying that in in my tiny piece of knowledge that I have, I haven't found any existence of God. Friends, what about the knowledge that's in the rest of the world? The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. 
Because it's based completely upon what his own experience and what his own existence is producing and has produced. And he wishes that there is no God because it does away with, as we said, judgment, eternity, and all of those things. And so he satisfies himself by saying there is no God. God calls that person a fool. A fool. But the Bible here says that the person who thinks, the person who talks like that, is foolish. Whenever you look at the world all around us, whenever you look at the the wonders of nature, I think it's just incredible. The complexity of the world in which we live. Are we really expected to believe that it all happened with a bang? You know, I think I've said to you before, whenever there's an explosion, things get torn apart and things get thrown into utter chaos. Yet we live in a world that has day and night every 24 hours. We live in a world that provides the different seasons. We live in a world that rotates on its axis and it revolves around the sun at a fixed speed. Things that are completely set in order. If you split any material, any material in the world around us into its various atoms, every single atom is like a a, a tiny solar system that has a nucleus in the middle and has got electrons revolving around it just as we revolve around the sun. Friends, everything is set completely in an order by a designer, by a creator who is the Lord God Almighty. And those are just one or two examples out of nature, that speaks of the existence of Almighty God. And then they tell us this stuff happens by chance. No, praise God tonight. He's alive. Hallelujah. And he is there. And the person who leaves God out is a fool. Let me move on very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 36, uh, sorry, 35 and 36. Let me read those to you for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 35 and 36. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Here's another one. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. I call this one the rationalistic fool. The person who tries to reason things. The person who tries to make rationality of everything. And you see, this is the person who doubts the resurrection and he denies the miraculous. He denies the supernatural. He denies the spiritual. Yet this is one of the most basic principles in the world around us, the principle of of resurrection. You see, friends, the farmer sows the seed. And Jesus says, except a corn of wheat or a a grain of corn falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, then it brings forth. You know, it used to amaze me whenever we were children. You could take a potato, and if it was slightly bigger, you cut it in half, and you get a bud out of each side of it, and you put it in the ground, and it grew other potatoes. It's an amazing thing. Listen, it's, it's, it's a picture in nature. Of, of resurrection. It's a picture in nature of life that comes through things dying. It's a picture in nature of, of eternity in many ways. Speaks of how life is there. One of the most basic principles in the world around us whereby food is grown, buried in the ground, it's gone. But soon, you know, the seed, a little green shoot appears up through the soil and it grows and it brings forth you know, abundant fold, as our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about. Friends, the Bible speaks of resurrection. The Bible speaks of new life. The Bible speaks of of, of life that's all around us. The Bible also speaks of a time when the dead shall be raised to life. Two resurrections that the Bible speak of. The first occurs whenever Jesus comes again for his own 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The first resurrection. 
And then the second resurrection is spoken of uh, at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. When everyone who doesn't belong to Christ is resurrected unto the judgment of the last day. You and I, every single one of us, will take part in one or other of those two resurrections. And dear one, the thing that should concern you and the thing that should concern me this evening is which resurrection will you take a part in? Will you be Christ's? Will you be raised whenever Christ comes? Or tell me, will you die in sin and be raised to face the judgment of the great white throne? You see, you can rationalize and you can say, how on earth could bones possibly be resurrected? How on earth could a body that's cremated ever be resurrected? How on earth could a body that has been buried at sea for hundreds of years ever be raised? How on earth could that happen? You know, sometimes whenever they're doing building work and they're doing excavation work and so on, sometimes they'll come upon bones. They'll come upon the remains of someone who has been in the ground for goodness knows how many hundreds of years. And people say, how on earth could that ever possibly be resurrected? Well, you know, friends, that's the very thing. How on earth could it be? But praise God tonight, we're talking supernatural. We're talking spiritual. We're talking about something that's completely out of this world. Because he's God tonight and he's God Almighty. The one with whom, praise God, nothing is impossible. Amen. That's who he is tonight. He's the God of the impossible. And he will raise again to life every single person that has ever breathed breath on this scene of time. He has the power to do that and he will do it. And in these verses he says, you are a fool if you don't believe that. You're a fool. The rationalistic fool. You will be resurrected either by Christ for himself or by Christ for judgment. And God says tonight, don't be a fool. The book of Proverbs speaks of another fool. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9. You don't have to turn to it. I call this one the shameless fool. It says, fools make a mock of sin. They make a mock of sin. You know, I remember reading about a, a miner worked down the mines in Tasmania. Read about him many years ago. He was an individual who had both eyes blown out in an explosion, was left completely blind. And in the story that I read about him, he was a thoughtless man. He was a, a profane man. He was a man who mocked sin. And one of the expressions, listen to this, that he often used was, God, curse my eyes. Can you imagine anybody coming out with a statement like that? God curse my eyes. And one day there was an explosion down the mine shaft where he was working. And in that explosion, he lost both of his eyes. You see, friends, tonight sin is the abominable thing that God hates. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave his life. Our Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood because of sin, because of your sin and because of my sin. And yet there are people who mock sin. The shameless fool. The Bible tells us God is not mocked. And those who mock at sin, or those who mock at what God says about it, the Bible says are complete fools. Let me bring you back for a moment to the chapter where we read together tonight. Matthew chapter 7. Because Jesus speaks about a fool here in this portion of Scripture. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, verse 24, and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And then Jesus says, Every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doesn't do them shall be likened unto a fool, a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind blew, beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall thereof. You know, here we see the thoughtless fool. 
the thoughtless fool. He builds his house. He builds his life. He builds his hope for the future upon sand. Nothing solid to rest upon. No foundation of security. Nothing but shifting sand. You see, friends, tonight you need a rock. If you go to build a house, you need hard ground to build that. You build a house upon a foundation. You need hard something solid, something that's secure to build on, or the house, as Jesus tells us in this story, will simply fall down. The Bible speaks about building your life, speaks about building your life upon the foundation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the rock tonight, praise God. He's the one who is immovable. He's the one who is undefeatable. He is the one, bless his holy name, who has power to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He is the one who has the power to raise the dead. He is the one who has the power to heal the body. He is the one, praise God, who rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And tonight, he is the solid rock for your life and for mine. Jesus Christ. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. I'm asking tonight, are you standing upon Christ? Is your life standing on solid ground tonight? Because you're standing upon the rock of ages, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Standing by faith upon his finished work at the cross of Calvary. Because every other foundation will fail you. Every other foundation will falter. It will shift. It will cause ruin. But praise God, Christ will never let you down. Hallelujah. Because that's who he is tonight. He's the firm rock of ages. And he's there not just in time, but praise God, he's there right through into eternity. Bless his wonderful and holy name. And I want to urge you tonight, don't be thoughtless about your life. You need to look onto the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're a fool. If you build your life upon anything else, the Bible calls you a fool. You know, Jesus spoke of a man in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. That's a story you'll know as well. I call this man the, the industrious fool. This man was a hard worker. This man put his back into what he was involved in. He wasn't a skeptic. He didn't say there was no God. He didn't mock sin. He didn't do that. But he thought to himself, he was a shrewd businessman, he thought to himself, I'll invest in my life. And so his ground brought forth plentiful. And he says, what am I going to do with all of my goods? I've nowhere to store them. I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater. And that night God said to him, you're a fool. Because this night your soul will be required of you. Earthly goods were all that he had. Earthly goods was what he lived for. And God called him a fool because in the midst of his industry, in the midst of his hard work and his dedication to what he was doing, he had left God out of the equation. And God said to him, you're a fool, an industrious fool. And then finally, very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. And friends, in that verse, we see the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Paul says, we are fools for Christ's sake. The Christian fool. I want to suggest tonight it's better to be a fool in the eyes of Christless men and be wise in the eyes of Almighty God than to be the other way around. To be a fool in God's sight means to die lost. To be a fool in God's sight means to live your life for everything but leave Christ out. To be a fool in God's sight means to go through life without looking at the supernatural, at God, at eternity, at all of those things. And to be a fool in God's sight is a person who will not listen to what God has to say about our souls in his own precious word. You know, whenever soul was converted. They called him a babbler. Festus called him mad whenever he testified to what God had done for him in his life. 
But Jesus had this to say about Saul. Jesus says he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Just one or two fools that we find in the word of God. Can I ask this evening, what kind of fool are you? What kind of fool? The atheist is a fool. No God. The rationalist is a fool. How can God? The shameless is a fool. Mocking God. The thoughtless is a fool. Building without God. The industrious is a fool. No time for God. And the Christian is a fool. It's all for God. What kind of a fool are you tonight? Is Jesus your savior? Are you standing upon the firm foundation? Have you listened to what Jesus has to say and obeyed them? His sayings. Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him Unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And whenever the storms of life came, and even the storms of death, praise God, that house stood firm, because it was standing upon the one who gave his life in order that we might have life. The one who gave his life in order that we might know victory. The one who gave his life that in death, praise God, we would have power even through the valley of the shadow. Is Christ yours tonight? Are you a fool in the sense of the word? Or tell me tonight, is Christ alive in your heart? A fool for Jesus. Within your heart and life you're saying, it's all for God. What kind of fool are you? You know, I'm glad. I'm glad that at least whenever I go from this scene of time, I'll be a Christian fool. Because Christ has saved me. Because I'm standing upon Christ. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Hallelujah. And I will be with him for all of eternity. Is that your testimony this evening? Let's just bow in prayer. Now you know where you stand, very simply. Are you saved tonight? Is Christ in your heart? Are you, building your, is you, are you building your life upon him? Are you standing upon what he has done for you at the cross of Calvary? If you haven't done that, if you're not standing there tonight, why don't you just reach out to him now and say, yes, Lord, forgive my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for the cross. And I tell you again tonight, in the authority of the word of God, if you'll reach out to him like that from the depth of your heart, he will hear. He will answer your prayer. He will save your soul. And praise God, time and eternity will be sorted for you because Christ will come to dwell within your life and within your being. Will you reach out to him right now? Young person, Maybe you're not saved. Older person, maybe you're not saved. Don't be a fool tonight. But take him now as your Lord and Savior. And Father, you know every single heart here this evening. Every one of us, Lord, you know us. Lord, if there's some heart at this moment in time, perhaps struggling, trying to decide, will you give deciding grace? Or if someone has just responded like that, Lord, pray in Jesus' name that you will come to that life with the abundance of your spirit and your power. Lord, for others perhaps in here tonight who are still undecided, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you'll write upon their hearts the fact that they are fools to turn their back upon what you have done for them at the cross of Calvary. And so, Lord, tonight we just commit this word to you. We ask your blessing upon it. And we pray, Lord, that every single life will be touched right now in this service by your presence. 
Encourage, Lord. Bless your own, we pray. And Lord, save those that should be saved in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.